All right, back again, and we will get started where we left off. Uh, finished up with muddy waters uh, very abruptly, and now we're back to talk about Howlin' Wolf. Uh, Howlin' Wolf was a, another chess records performer. Uh, again, here uh, in a string, and I and I didn't name, I, I didn't put all of the major chess performers. Again, just the biggest of the big: uh, Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, Little Walter. I mean, there are a lot more. There's uh, there's a lot more that we could have talked about that I could have thrown in here, but you know, it's one of those where we just don't have time. Uh, um, there is actually a movie about the chess label. Uh, it's called Cadillac Records, uh, and it, it basically, in the span of the movie, it it tries to cover the entire uh, timeline of chess records, you know, from its beginning all the way to its peak, and then eventually the end. Uh, you know, another figure I'm not going to be talking about in the notes would be Willie Dixon. Willie Dixon was, I mean, he played in Muddy Waters' band. He was a songwriter. Uh, you know, he was a performer in his own right. But most of the stuff that he did was either working in production or songwriting. Uh, because, and that's one of the things, he wrote songs for Muddy Waters, he wrote songs for Little Walter, he wrote songs for Howlin' Wolf, you know, he wrote some stuff for Chuck Berry, Chuck Berry, even though he's looked at as a rock and roll musician, Chuck Berry got his start with Chess Records, I'm sorry there, uh, I have a touch screen on the computer and there was some kind of smudge on there when I tried to get it off and advance the slide. But back to Howlin' Wolf, uh, his real name was Chester Burnett. Uh, like I said, most of these blues artists, they had nicknames of some type. Uh, he was nicknamed the Wolf uh, originally. Then at one point for a very short period of time, he tried yodeling on a couple of songs. And uh, it didn't really sound like a traditional yodel. People started referring to him as the Howler. Then the two nicknames ended up merging together and he becomes Howlin' Wolf. Uh, if you do by chance or if you have ever watched Cadillac Records, uh, the way that they portray particularly Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf isn't really historically accurate. Uh, in the movie, they portray Muddy, they bring Howlin' Wolf in as a new artist that almost, and I'm not saying he didn't have a reputation. He was very big. He was a very imposing man. He was like 6'6", six, six, around 300 pounds, big guy. And, uh, you know, he could be very intimidating. He could be very imposing. But in the movie, they almost play him off. You know, of course, the focus of the movie is Muddy Waters. I mean, you follow Muddy Waters all the way through the movie. Howlin' Wolf is one of the side characters, and they almost kind of almost present him as a bad guy. Uh, or at least he's like the exact opposite of Muddy Waters, the way he's depicted. Turns out, in real life, they were close personal friends when Howlin' Wolf first made it to Chicago. He lived with Muddy Waters for about six months. So there there wasn't that rivalry. There wasn't that animosity like they tried to play. You know, and that's the thing. In the movie, the, they had to bring some sort of conflict along, you know, just to give an individual or something in the storyline to kind of push Muddy's story forward. Uh, but in real life, Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters were uh, very good friends. Despite the fact that Howlin' Wolf was so big, he was extremely athletic, extremely agile. Uh, you know, there are stories about stage shows that he did where in the middle of his songs, and it, you know, it's not that you don't see people do stuff like this at rock concerts anyway, uh, 
you know, again, this is one story that I do have to tell. Uh, usually I leave these out of these videos because they eat up time. But one time I went to see a band called the Stone Temple Pilots in the 90s grunge band from around the time Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains. Uh, they they were kind of like second tier compared to those bands. But I went to see Stone Temple Pilots in Louisville about 10 or 11 years ago. And uh, the, the band had gotten back together. The front man, unfortunately, Scott Wyland, uh, the reason the band broke up in the first place was because of his drug problem. Uh, they got back together in hopes that his issues were behind him, but they, they weren't. You know, within the first song or two, you could tell that uh, he was on something while he was on stage. He uh, came out in a, what they would have referred to at one point, like in the 20s and 30s, as a zoot suit, uh, just big oversized suit, shoulder pads, hat, everything. And it was like every song, you know, some article of clothing was coming off. Uh, by the time you get about halfway through their set in their show, he's got a uh, tank top, the suit pants, and his dress shoes. Well, at one point, he kicked his shoes off while he's singing a song. He's got the microphone in one hand, and if you've ever been to the Louisville Gardens, it's a theater, so you've got the stage, an orchestra pit, theater seating, you know, chairs. It wasn't like where we were standing in the, standing in the floor, uh, like general admission. We had seats in the theater, but then around the sides, the walls of the theater, you had these little alcoves that had a, you know, had statues in them. And each statue, you know, the first one was roughly stage level and then a few feet farther away from the stage and, if, you know, a foot or two higher, yet another statue, another couple of feet away, another foot or two higher, more statues, and it went on. As he's singing the song, he just goes to the edge of the stage and he climbs out onto the first statue, holds onto the statue, is singing into the microphone, and then he kind of shimmies around, he switches hands with the mic, grabs the mic or grabs the next statue with the other arm and he gets about three or four statues out away from the stage and by this point since the stage is elevated he's about 15 feet maybe close to 20 feet off the ground they had to stop the show they had to stop the song when he realized that he couldn't get back down on his own they had to stop the show. The band took a break. They left the stage, and you could tell that, like, the drummer and the guitarist were mad that, you know, he, he's already going off the rails. I mean, they the tour had only been going on for a couple of weeks, and I think I read somewhere after this show, they only played, like, three more tour dates after their show in Louisville, and they canceled the rest of the tour. Uh, and... I want to say it was maybe a year or two years after that, Wyland, uh, I believe, ended up uh, dying from an overdose. So it, it was a problem that he never got past. So, But he was a small guy. He wasn't 6'6", six, six, 300 pounds. Howlin' Wolf, there are, uh, there are plenty of stories about the way he would run around, dance on stage. There were uh, some stories about how he uh, would climb, you know, when the stage, when the show begins and the curtains open on the stage, he starts climbing, you know, 300 pound man, and he's climbing up the curtains on the stage and about eight, 10 feet off the ground. And still, you know, he's got the mic in one hand, kind of like Wyland was doing on the statues I was talking about. And, you know, he's still performing. Uh, he won one Grammy in his career for Smokestack Lightning. Uh, Smokestack Lightning is probably one of my favorite songs by Howlin' Wolf. Uh, Backdoor Man, uh, I can't remember if I put that one on the playlist or not. It, that's one that I, every once in a while I switch up the songs that are on the playlist from year to year. Backdoor Man was actually covered by The Doors uh, when they were at their peak in the late 1960s. Uh, again, The Doors, another rock band that was heavily influenced by the blues. Now, the last of the chest artists that I'm going to talk about uh, in the notes 
is little Walter, uh, real name Walter Jacobs. Was born May first, nineteen thirty. Died February fifteenth, nineteen sixty eight. So he died at the age of thirty seven. Uh, you know, while they do have something that we talk about in the class from time to time, if you've ever uh, heard about or read anything on the internet about the Twenty Seven Club, that there is this uh, spooky, I guess you could call it. Uh, coincidence that there are a lot of celebrities, you know, uh, musicians, actors, actresses, sometimes professional athletes that because of accidents or because of circumstances they brought upon themselves, you know, a lot of famous people die at the age of 27. Uh, at one point in the span of like 13 months, in the you know 1969 into 1970, I think Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and Jim Morrison, the lead singer of The Doors, all three of them died within a year of each other, and they were all 27 years old. Little Walter was older than that, but Little Walter was very troubled in his personal life for his entire 37 years. He had a very rough uh, home life before he ended up getting into music. Uh, they they touch on that a little bit in that movie that I mentioned earlier, uh, Ch uh, Cadillac Records. Uh, I'm not going to get into it here. Just going to talk about his music because we need to move on. But the thing about Little Walter that makes him stand out is, first of all, I don't know what you all think, but to me, the harmonica, a good blues harmonica, sounds really good. A bad harmonica is just that very bad. Uh, Bob Dylan, even though he's one of the greatest songwriters in musical history, he would play the harmonica from time to time, and his most definitely was not a good harmonica. When Bob Dylan plays the harmonica, it sounds like somebody is mutilating a goose. Little Walter, on the other hand, uh, again, listen to a couple of the songs that I put on the playlist from him, My Babe, and... Uh, Last Night has harmonica in it, of course, because that was his instrument, but uh, My Babe definitely has more harmonica in it. One that I mentioned here uh, on the slide, Juke, made it to number one on the R&B charts in 1952. It just shows that by the time you get into the late 40s, early 50s, music's starting to move in a different direction away from blues. It's not rock and roll yet, but it's moving that direction. Uh, Muddy Waters ended up uh, maybe not necessarily discovering Little Walter, but Little Walter starts to make enough of a name for himself in Chicago in the early 40s that, you know, Muddy sees him play a couple of times and they get him, you know, to come into Chess Records, try things out. He ends up getting signed to a deal. And, you know, he plays with Muddy Waters' band. You know, Muddy would come out sometimes and play guitar for Little Walter or play on his albums and stuff like that when they were recording. But the big thing about him with his harmonica is he was the first person to ever amplify. You know, you can't really, like, plug in a harmonica, but, you know, he would hold the microphone up to his harmonica and be able to, you know, broadcast it through the amp. And that was something that no one else was doing. You know, now people started doing it after Little Walter started to get popular. But it was a way, just like with the electric guitar, that you could amplify the sound of the instrument so it, along with vocals, could be heard across a noisy bar or a big club, something like that. Uh, you know, he recorded with Muddy Waters, you know, he played harmonica on some of Waters' songs, Waters would play guitar on some of Little Walter's songs, you know, throughout the 1950s, the problem was is that around the time, you know, he gets big in his own right with Juke, you know, number one R&B song in 1952, and as the money really starts rolling in, and you can blame it on his troubled past or whatever, uh, he didn't do drugs, at least initially, but his biggest problem was by the time he died, you know, he was a full-blown alcoholic. Uh, 
and alcohol really derailed his music career. Uh, got to the point where, and we'll, we'll talk about this with quite a few musicians over the course of the year. As the fame comes, money comes with it. You know, as they say in certain rap songs, "Mo money, mo problems." Uh, his his alcoholism became such an issue that he didn't necessarily get dropped by Chess Records, but it was to the point where Leonard Chess didn't even want him coming in to record. Uh, because Muddy Waters always kind of, maybe not necessarily saw him as a son, but he was quite a bit younger. He was like a little brother, maybe like a son. Uh, when he saw how hard times had gotten for little Walter, that, that last little bit, uh, a couple of years before little Walter passed away, uh, he had brought him back in and you know, was just so, hey, if he's sitting in on a session to, you know, if he's playing harmonica for a song that's being recorded at the studio, he's got to get, you know, paid at least, you know, 50 bucks, 100 bucks uh, as a studio musician, even if he wasn't recording and making money in his own right anymore. Throughout the 1950s, he was about as big as it got for African-American performers. He had seven top 10 R&B albums in the 1950s, uh, completely changed the way that people looked at the harmonica as an instrument. You know, before this point, you know, harmonica might have been part of a blues band, but it was always in the background. He, not only was he the lead singer when he was performing, he would be the lead singer, but he also played the harmonica. So it, it and the fact that he had it with him and he was at the mic and he was able to amplify it it brought it out of the background it became something in the forefront uh he did throughout his entire life and again it had to do with his upbringing some of the personal issues that he had to deal with always known for a violent temper and once he did start drinking supposedly he didn't start drinking until you know he was in music in the music business already uh but once he started drinking then it just took over his life uh died in a bar fight or depending on what version of the story you hear he either died in a bar fight when he was drunk or it happened after he left the bar and you know, one version of the story i heard is you know he got jumped outside of the bar after he left where there was an altercation inside but you know that happened in you know he wasn't the guy wasn't even 40 years old when it occurred Next guy I want to talk about uh, is kind of like Muddy Waters, uh, even more so than Muddy Waters. If you have, if you don't know anything about the blues, but you've heard of someone we'll talk about in this chapter, it's probably BB King. Uh, given name Riley King, uh, born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. He was born September 16th, 1925, just passed away a few years ago, May 14th, 2015. One of my regrets in terms of music is I had the opportunity to go see B.B. King before he died. I want to say it was like uh, 2011, 2012, something like that. He was playing uh, across the river at uh, whatever the name of the casino is, across the river from Louisville. Uh, Horseshoe, Caesar's Palace, whatever it is, uh, he was playing there, and I mean, the you know he was already, I mean, he was almost ninety years old when he died, but at this point he would have been 86, 87 years old, and I, I would have, if I had bought the ticket, I would have ended up on the second row, and the only reason I didn't go is because I started reading some of the reviews. Uh, beforehand, and I'm glad I did because, of course, I think the default on the website was to the best reviews. When I started looking at the more recent reviews, I went back like six months, a year looking at reviews, and everybody was giving it like one star, or somebody might have given it two stars. Uh, one review was, you know, those last few years that he was performing, you know, it was that he came out on stage 45 minutes late. He only stayed on stage for 30 minutes and he didn't even make it through two songs in 30 minutes. Uh, some of the things that they talked about, like he would lose track. I mean, it sounded like he might've almost been suffering from dementia 
and whoever his caretaker was or whoever was responsible for him was just wheeling him out on stage so they could get so they could make money off of people coming to see him because he was a music legend. Uh, he was Delta Blues influenced, of course, growing up in Memphis right there on the Mississippi River, uh, even though it's not down in the Mississippi Delta. Being in Memphis, you also see the incorporation of a lot of jazz in his music. You know, he did he had a much more jazz type backup band than you see from most other uh, blues musicians. You know, there is a different in the instrumentation that you would see in a blues band as opposed to a jazz band. His guitar playing is most definitely uh, blues, blues, but his backup band and thus the sound of his songs had more of a jazz sound. I mean, he, he ended up using a lot more uh, in terms of brass instruments you know, saxophones, things like that in his music than you would hear in a traditional blues band. Uh, he bought his first guitar in 1937, uh, and while he might have played other guitars from time to time, Gibson was what he played most. Uh, his original guitar, he nicknamed it Lucille, and even though he claimed that he played the same guitar you know, his entire career, uh, it got to, I mean, to this day, Gibson even makes a Lucille model that you could go out and buy. But I'd say they probably provided him with several Lucilles over the years. Uh, before he got into music, you know, he grew up in the South. He grew up picking cotton on a plantation uh, in Memphis. He ends up in the early 1950s working as a DJ, you know, in his uh, early to mid-20s. That's where he got the nickname BB. Uh, it stood for the Beale Street, which Beale Street is the place in Memphis where all the blues nightclubs are. Uh, and he, his radio name was the Beale Street Blues Boy. Blues Boy, BB. People start referring to him as BB King because when he wasn't working as a DJ, he'd be performing in some of the clubs there and on Beale Street at night. <clears throat> The big thing about B.B. King is where up to this point, blues had always been off to the side. It, it was not part of pop music. And while pop music in 1950s, you know, the 1960s is different than pop music today, blues never would have been considered pop. It, it was not mainstream at all. That's why I talked about, you know, when... Uh, Helen Wolf winning a uh, Grammy Award, Muddy Waters winning six Grammy Awards over his career. Things like that were amazing because those artists didn't get a lot of public recognition to, you know, that you would think might keep their name out of the mix of winning major awards like that. B.B. King is responsible for bringing blues music into the mainstream. Uh, and he's looked at, you know, in modern times as the face of blues, regardless of the fact that there may have been other blues artists before him that were just as big, if not bigger. But right place, right time, as a blues guitarist, the spotlight ended up getting shined on him. Uh, his first big hit was Three O'Clock Blues, got released in 1951, made it to number one on the R&B charts. Again, you see, anytime you see in the notes where it says number whatever, and I'll have R&B or country, that's because generally when you hear about a song making such and such, they're talking about the pop charts. You know, pop, the pop chart is considered like the main musical chart. Uh, that's when you know as a genre artist, you know, like a blues musician or a country musician, that's when you know somebody has gotten really big when they cross over. When their music, you know, a number one song on the R&B chart, and notice there's nothing else listed here, no other chart numbers listed, but you know that you have a big artist. At this point in history, in the early 1950s, artists did not cross over. And look, it takes 19 years. His only top 20 pop hit Biggest song he ever released, The Thrill Is Gone, made it to number 15 in 1970. That, that is when he becomes the face of blues music to the mainstream music listener. 
uh, you know, what you'll see as we start talking about the birth of rock and roll in the next chapter. Elvis Presley starts out when Elvis Presley starts out because he was from the South, because he was country whenever he talked. His music starts charting on the country charts. Uh, just to give you an idea, and it shows how their careers went in different directions in terms of their sound. When they were both young and starting out, you've got Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash were recording for Sun Records in uh, Memphis at the same time. You know, they knew each other. They toured with each other before they both got huge. Johnny Cash, his early stuff sounded more rock and roll than Elvis's earliest stuff did. But Elvis ends up becoming the king of rock and roll, baby. And Johnny Cash, the man in black, you know, there's not many names, if any names, in country music that are bigger than Johnny Cash. But B.B. King was that for blues music. You know, whether you like blues, whether you like his music, as opposed to another blues musician's, B.B. King is the most recognizable name in blues history. Uh, he did have his farewell tour in 2006. Uh, again, you can see I've been using some of these notes for a while. I said he continues to make music uh, today as of 2011. Of course, he ended up passing away four years later. But it, after 2006, he really cut back on the amount of uh, touring that he did. He recorded 52 albums over the course of 60 years. Uh, when you look at the fact that Metallica comes out with an album about every seven or eight years, it seems like 52 albums in 60 years is a lot of work. He stayed busy. And when he wasn't recording, he was generally touring. You know, At this point in history, especially for blues musician, musicians or country musicians, they didn't have a lot of time off. Uh, B.B. King won 15 Grammys over the course of his career. He ended up winning the Lifetime Achievement Award from uh, Grammy in 1987. Also got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1987. Uh, some of the songs, again, he's got a huge list like Muddy Waters of great songs you should listen to. Thrill, of, for Thrill, Thrill is Gone is probably his most famous any way, shape, or form that you can think of. Every Day I Have the Blues... I really like three o'clock blues. Uh, there are so many. Again, the guy recorded 52 albums over the course of 60 years. There are so many different songs you could listen to. But another one you need to check out on that playlist that I posted in the classroom last week. Uh, let me back out of this real quick and take a look at the notes here. Uh, i tell you what, we're going to stop right there. And I will pick up with Buddy Guy the next time I make a video. And I guess that'll do it for tonight. And I will, or today, and I will talk to you all later. See ya.